Hello, and welcome to episode three of the CPTSD podcast. My name is Elizabeth Pace. I'm a licensed professional counselor supervisor. I'm joined by my partner and colleague, Tabitha Bird Weaver, a licensed professional counselor and licensed marriage and family therapist. We decided that we wanted to talk today a little bit about the affective neuroscience, um, the polyvagal theory, um, and loosely about attachment. So we're not just going to talk about straight neuroscience. You could Google that. Um, but we are going to talk about how, how we wire for survival and then how we wire for survival in dysfunctional or dangerous circumstances. So I'm going to let tab start. We both, uh, we both talked about being like, what if someone finds out that we're not neuroscientists? Um, and of course the reminder is we're not neuroscientists, but what we're trying to do is make, um, pretty dense information, easily digestible for our clients on a regular basis, because they come in and say things like, why am I like this? And if everyone in the world is saying to them, well, because there's something wrong with you, not something wrong with the system, there's something wrong with you. They go, oh, so there must be something pathologically the matter with me. And what, you know, people like Tab and myself do is we look at somebody and go, what if your, your brain and body did the best possible thing to keep you well and alive in those circumstances? It wired you for survival but in circumstances that are chronically dysfunctional or not nurturing. So with that as the light introduction, I'm going to let you start and then I'm going to jump in. Sounds good to me. I think the place to start is by saying directly to you, if you're watching this for your own symptoms or for somebody you love, your brain did do the best it could do. It's not even a what if. And I know I know that's what you meant, Beth, right? Right. Because you're still here. And you're still functioning enough to do this today. So congratulations and welcome. We're really glad you're here. I think that um, probably the easiest place to start is where I start with all of my clients. And that is, let's talk really fundamentally about what's keeping you stuck in some of your symptoms and then why that matters or how your brain participates in that. So myself included, when I began my healing journey and all of my clients feel some very similar things to each other, right? And, and so those things are... Um, no matter what I think I should do or plan I make, I can't follow through on it for one reason or another, right? Overwhelm, distraction, whatever it is, lots of different reasons. And I can't think straight when I get into these situations that are triggering to me and that I make more mistakes in life. I make more bad decisions. That's what I end up hearing. Um, and as we talked about in the beginning of this, my, my intro into therapy is because I realized the man that I was wanting to date at the time was the least available person I had attempted a relationship with so far. And that was like this big ding light bulb went above my head. Like this is not working. Why am I choosing worse and worse and worse? So he was cute though. I just got to put that out there. <laughs> Very if adorable. Cute, why would you do it? You know, if they weren't cute, <laughs> right. well, someone's got to hook you. All right. <laughs> okay. So the bottom line is when you are triggered from trauma, especially trauma that you don't necessarily explicitly remember, and we'll talk more about implicit and explicit memory in just a minute. What happens is you get hijacked by your brain. And there are four basic ways we've discovered through at least 30 years of research that we tend to get hijacked. One is a fight response. And that comes from our need when we were more exposed to nature and currently, but, but fundamentally our need to fight off whatever it is that's trying to attack us, either a wild animal or a warring village next door that's trying to steal our stuff and women, <laughs> you know, that, that happened. And so there's a fight response. And that can show up as anger, rage, irritability, overwhelm, flooding. Lots of the people I talk with that get the fight response um, blush a lot. Um, and so that's one way. Another way is flight, which is I can't win this battle. I'm out of here. And, you know, fleeing for your life. With CPTSD, there's also 
another chunk of symptoms that can happen and they're the freeze and submit or fawn response. Yeah. And that's really where the polyvagal theory is going to come in, you know, shed some light for us today, Beth, but that freeze response is kind of like the deer in the headlights. I don't know what to do and I'm going to paralyze myself. So hopefully the predator won't be able to track me. It won't be able to see me. Right. There's a great example of that in Jurassic Park when they're leaning against the car in that. I feel, you, I feel like you were just in my brain because I was like, yeah, like in Jurassic Park. And then you said it. Yeah. Exactly, if you right? don't move, then the T-Rex can't see you. Exactly. Exactly. So even when it's blowing your hat off with its breath. <laughs> right. So um, so there's that freeze response. And a lot of people literally feel paralyzed. Right. Um, and paralysis can show up in life in self-sabotaging ways. We don't always have to have that muscle rigidity that well, we're I, I, an example I like to give to my clients when they're about to go home for any holiday. I'm yeah. like, I just want to remind you of some things. You have a credit card or you have your own money. There is a door that you can walk out of yes. and that you can like call a cab, get an Uber. You can get yourself out of there because freezing isn't always necessarily like frozen and like physically frozen. It could be, I'm still at my mom's house, even though I'm like swimming in terror, I haven't left. So, you know, that going in a little bit more to dissociation. But yeah, like that freezing doesn't always look like I'm stuck on the couch. It could look like I'm stuck in this house, even yeah, though or, I, or my own world. Out, I, I don't, I don't remember the way to leave because I have essentially gone back to the way I used to cope when I was in that house all those years ago. Totally. And there's some really interesting, although I don't think humane research about that with some dogs in cages, and we can talk about it that another time. Um, uh, you know, fundamentally, they didn't, even when the doors open after trauma, they couldn't leave. Right. Right. They couldn't choose that. So, but what you were just saying about going home for the holidays also really overlaps with that submit or that fawn response. And that is thinking about a possum that plays dead. Right. So the way that might've shown up during trauma is I'm going to pretend to be asleep. Right. Or I'm going to dissociate so bad and so far out of my body that I'm not actually here while my body is enduring this experience. Yeah. So we've got fight, flight, freeze, fawn. And those are the four ways that you really can get hijacked uh, through your triggers. So do you have anything you want to talk about there before we hop into where that comes through in the brain? Yes, actually, that is what I want to talk about is where it comes through in the brain. But I, I will just say briefly, because I brought it up, I think in maybe episode one or two, um, it, for the same reason that you can be in your therapist's office and you and they are like, oh yeah, next time you can say blank. And you are going, yeah, great idea. And your therapist is like, sounds like you really got it. You practice it in your therapist's office in this very safe relational environment. And they're like, you're doing good. And you're like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to try it. Um, the, the problem with like not experiencing any sort of relational safety, right? Um, and we're going we're gonna to get to like that in the body, like attachment theory, et cetera, um, is when your brain perceives something as threatening based on past experiences stored in your hippocampus, it shunts all resources away from your cerebral cortex, that higher order part of your brain, and down into protecting you. So this is also why someone can say, I knew what I wanted to say to my partner, to my boss. I had practiced it. But when the time came to do it, I froze. When the time came to do it, my throat closed up. Yes. Um, they asked me, is there anything more you want to add in the meeting? And I went, no. <laughs> then I go back to my therapist's office and say, Classically, I failed. No, mm. you didn't have the resources to soothe your nervous system. So you can't take something that you can do in a relationally safe environment easily and just immediately apply it in a place that feels threatening because your nervous system won't let you do it. Absolutely. Especially if that environment is triggering because of past trauma, like going home for Christmas, right? Yeah. 
We absolutely dip right back into those center parts of the brain. So let me open up what the brain looks like. And again, if you want to know more specifics about that, please look it up. It's everywhere online. It's not hard to find. We're just trying to give you a, a bite-sized chunk of how this works so that you can take the next step. Right. So at the core of our being is what's known as the reptilian brain. And literally it came from a time in our evolution where we were all instinct, no emotion. And so if you think about a lizard, they scurry pretty fast. They're pretty aware of what is going on for their safety and there's no emotional attachment to it. And so that part of your brain is what is known as the brain stem. And that stem part absolutely comes online to get you out of a situation in some physical ways. For example, it will take all of the blood from your digestion system and pump it out into your extremities so that you can fight or flight, right? And so just so you know, a lot of people with CPTSD experience nausea, especially as they're reworking some of that trauma. It's because your body is responding to the stored instinctual memory. And food sensitivities and like GI upset and IBS and like Crohn's disease. Yeah. So if you're one of those people who's like, I have a bunch of these physical symptoms, but everything in my upbringing was perfect. And you're like, but where, where are the roots? Like what's going on? Um, Making that connection too of right. If your body is in the threat response all the time. So if we're calling the threat response fight or flight, um, then we would be calling the relaxation response rest and digest. (laughs) So if you're always in fight or flight, then you can't rest and digest insomnia, nausea, uh, GI issues, et cetera. And long, yeah, exactly. And long-term mental health issues, because guess what else is made in your gut? Like over three quarters of the serotonin in your body is made through your digestive system, not in your brain. So if you're always in fight or flight, no wonder you're depressed right? No wonder. And so one of our goals with this podcast is to help people move out of a self-shaming experience into understanding what's actually happening and that you can change it. Mm -hmm. And it feels very threatening, but it's possible. So let's, let's pop back into the brain. So we've got that brainstem, which is from reptilian era, and then moving up into what's known as the amygdala, um, the mammalian brain, that is where we store our emotional responses and understandings. So that involves the part that Beth was talking about with the hippocampus, also a little gland that can control your life known as the amygdala or brain part. And that part is where we start making emotional connections to the trauma and to the perpetrators of the trauma. Mm. And we can really get stuck in forever in that area because when we're triggered, it feels like it's going to last forever. And if you're triggering around your environment, it can be really, again, hijack you, not only with that instinctual, oh my gosh, I can't handle this. I have to get out of there, but the emotional part. And that can feel like that shame piece that you were talking about last episode where we cave. Right. Right. Um, The example I like to give to my clients for this is also when you think about development, brain development, um, there's also sort of the process by which your brain develops, which is why if you ever ask your teenager, why did you do that? What were you thinking? And they go, Uh, it's because their prefrontal cortex, their impulse control has not developed yet. And it won't develop until we're about 25, 27 years old. Tabitha is going to get there. Um, But one of the things that happens to kids in untenable living circumstances is you can't tell a three-year-old, don't worry. It's only going to be about five more lifetimes until you can get out of here. That's inconceivable, right? Or to a five-year-old, it's only, you are only going to have to go through five more lifetimes, four more lifetimes until you can get up out of here. And they're looking at you like, what? Because that's just forever. That's just forever. And so you wire yourself to survive forever in how, whatever way you need to. And so in in Sandra Paulson's book, When There Are No Words, she talks about how despair is actually one of the first coping strategies that a child develops 
Mm. Because it's basically kind of like saying, not cognitively because you don't have the brain power, but just like somewhere emotionally in your body. Um, well, this scary dark forest is where I live. So I guess I just have to figure out how to make it work. Even though it's terrible, it's never going to change. Every time I've hoped for things to get different, that has hurt worse. It must be the hope that's the problem. Cue the hopelessness. Out. And when you compare that, or not compare that, but correlate that to the idea that kids are really egocentric, appropriately so, not only is it despair and hopelessness, but it's my fault. Or, right. or I'm the despair, right? right? right. So right. just let's, let's do a quick developmental um, brain process, well, you know, as you were saying. So between birth, and I would say in, your, in utero, but between birth and about three months, babies are primarily in that reptilian brain. They don't have verbalization. They don't really emotionally engage, you know, that old joke about, are they giggling or is it gas? <laughs> you know, before three months, it's probably gas because that <laughs> mammalian brain has not come online yet. They're trying to figure out how to regulate safety around feeding, um, e- eliminating and comforting. And so if you have an inept, abusive, or neglectful caregiver during that time, your root of safety is fundamentally damaged. And it's irreparable. I'd like to also uh, remind everyone that when we say like inept, abusive, or neglectful, uh, we can also add to that highly traumatized caregiver thereby doesn't have the skill set or the ability to be nurturing. Right. Or maybe may feel that same sort of like shame, despair. It's my fault when they hear their baby crying that they are experiencing extraordinary frustration. They've got this like really cross face. So a lot of times I think that the major misconception for folks who go, my financial resources were getting like my financial needs were getting met in my household. I had two parents who were alive and married to each other my entire childhood. And we go, okay. And, you know, what about them? What was their growing up like? You know, what was, what were the quote unquote, like unspoken rules in your house? Um, So when, when my clients go, I had good enough parents, but then I start hearing them talk about how stupid they are, how lazy they are, um, how they can't ever get anything right. And I'm like, then who taught you how to talk that way about yourself? Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think remembering that most parents who traumatize kids are traumatized is a way to remember compassion about it. But I want to be really clear, and I'm looking at you right now, if you need to hear this, (laughs) that is not your responsibility to fix. That's right. Even if it's true, right? And so there's a real stressful space in healing trauma where you have to decide it's okay to say your parents didn't do the best job. And that can be very threatening for those of us who want to keep our parents as whole, right? Because we want that as kids, even when we're adults. So does that make sense? We want there to be big, safe, powerful people with answers somewhere. It's kind of like when you have that painful aha moment that your doctor is just like a person, (laughs) you know? Yeah, they have a lot. Yeah, they know a lot, but it doesn't mean that they have all the answers. And you're just like, then I'm in this alone. Oh God, it's the same thing with your parents, right? Like they, they need, they are God to you up to a certain age, right? Yeah. Like, because they are in control of everything for you. Um, but you know, when you're 35, when you're 40 and you're like, it's not safe for me to say that my mother didn't do a good job when I was growing up. Um, see, see wiring for lack of safety. What do I need to do to get safe? I need to tell myself that my mother is safe. Cause I'm going to talk about that in a minute uh, okay. related to like how we wire for safety. Uh, but so yeah, mammalian brain, midbrain, your amygdala, your hippocampus, like some of these basic sort of affective uh, circuitry and, and parts of your brain. Yep. That's the middle part. And that's the part that allows us to verbalize things as well. The trick with trauma is when we are in a traumatic experience, especially like CPTSD, which is repeated trauma and the inability to leave it. Right. Because if you're a kid, where are you going to go at three years? What are you going to go get a job, pack a bindle, hop on a train? get an apartment. Right. How would you even know that you needed to go? Right. Or worse, you've had the experience of telling something, telling somebody that things aren't right and having them look at you and go, we don't talk about that. 
Yeah. Or telling your parent and then your parent going, we don't talk about the things that are the matter outside of this house. Are you out of your mind? So the message you get is this is the worst place and it's the only place and it's the safest place. And you have no power to change it. Jiminy crickets. No doubt. So after that midbrain area, I'm just going to keep thrusting us forward. After that midbrain area, we get into the human brain, which is that upper and prefrontal cortex that we were just talking about a minute ago, Beth. And that is where we start having executive functioning. For example, decision-making through logic, right? Instead of all emotion, Um, our ability to create a narrative stems between that midbrain and the prefrontal cortex. And so this is where we try to make sense out of our life. And if things don't make sense, it's complicated to move forward because you don't have a foundation to base your next decisions on. So in in this way, our brain helps us to preserve our survival because it's got all of these kind of like, um, oh shoot, what's it called? Like a pressure valve that will go when it's, when it's too much, we'll revert down, down, down until we're into instinctual. And just also, so you know, if you're triggered now, that is not a process you can control. The best thing, I mean, it's going to happen if it happens, the best thing you can do is recognize when it happens. And as soon as possible, start doing something to get the parasympathetic nervous system to come back on. Right. So when you say parasympathetic nervous system, you mean the relaxation response. The Correct. The rest digest, and digest. Right? So the sympathetic nervous system, uh, even though it sounds maybe like it's, it's, it, it is having a sympathetic response to threat essentially, which is like reacting to threat. So that's why it's called the sympathetic nervous system. That's that fight or flight. So when you are activated and triggered, your sympathetic nervous system is like all hands on deck. Um, Robert Sapolsky wrote a really beautiful book called why zebras don't get ulcers. And he talks a lot about how, um, less highly developed animals, animals with thinner cerebral cortexes, cortices than we have, um, are actually able to cue back into the relaxation response a lot easier than we are because we have this ability to sort of like think our way into like saying, okay, it's it's this way right now. It's going to be this way forever. Or like, oh my God, this email from my boss. And then I spend the rest of my day in the the threat response. Whereas after a zebra runs away from a lion, it immediately starts breathing deeply, which is cueing the message. The threat has passed. Absolutely. And I'll tell you just an interesting tangent. They also shudder and shake and get that electrical charge out of their body. Right. And so yeah. when I, when I have noticed my clients that are doing deep therapy work, not the beginning, but like where they're strong enough and skilled enough to handle going way in there looking for the root. A lot of times they will absolutely have physical responses beyond like, Ooh, I can feel that moving. Mm-hmm. Right. But, um, the case study I wrote, uh, Hazel had full body contortions and she allowed herself to do that. Mm. And she was skilled and articulate enough to know that that was moving. She literally said it's moving the energy out. Mm -hmm. So if you start getting trembly when you're in recovery, please understand that's normal. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's hop towards the polyvagal piece. And I just want to take our attention back to that reptilian brain because that brainstem is where the polyvagal nerve comes out and runs into your body. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, Beth. Well, it's funny because like polyvagal theory is, you know, I, I, people say it and I go, yeah, okay. Head nod makes sense. So the vagus nerve, um, there's so much more, um, to us than our brain. It's kind of like our Western idea that we are this like beautiful, sharp intellect and our body, our arms and legs is just like walking around as a vehicle for our most precious head, which is Mm -hmm. carrying our brain. Uh, When in reality, um, there are neurons in the heart. There are neurons in the gut, like in your belly and in your intestines. When people talk about things like I felt heartache or like I, I, when we say things like trust your gut, It's because we're getting, we should be getting a lot more information from our body 
from our, our corporeal form than just from our head. So um, it's my hope that in a couple of episodes, we're going to get real spicy and talk about things like cultural historical trauma Ooh. and settler colonialism Let's and some other it. things that are also one of the reasons that we're all like, yeah, that book was written by a white guy. No disrespect if you're a white guy listening. Like that it's just like if ever, if everything is like head knowledge, head knowledge, head knowledge, when the reality is we have a lot more information that we can be drawing upon from our bodies. Um, so the vagus nerve runs down throughout your body, um, touching on a lot of other points, which is one of the reasons that when I do, um, when I do advanced integrative therapy with someone and we're talking about something that's related to like safety, protection, connection, et cetera. We're treating that kind of trauma. And I go, where do you feel the sensation in your body? And they go in my root. And when I say root, if you're not sure what I'm talking about, think about the base of your tailbone, yep. like that you, you could and should be having a sensory experience of your body from the neck down. And there are a lot of people that don't have a sensory experience of their body from the neck down with the exception of pain. Mm. their body is essentially screaming at them, but they are, they don't have this kind of like intuitive relationship about like what's going on, what's happening. Right. So I, um, so back to like, why does the zebra, why is the zebra able to cue the relaxation response? Diaphragmatic breathing, which is breathing to expand and contract your diaphragm or belly breathing. If you've heard someone describe it that way, puts pressure on the vagus nerve which shoots the message back up to your brain, there is not a threat right now because there's no way that there could be a threat as well as my capacity to breathe this deeply, which is why after we run away from something, we're like <sighs> breathing really heavy, right? Um, and like that, that shudder and shake response where we're like sort of cleaning, clearing out the cortisol, the lactic acid, the norepinephrine. Um, and so one of the first things I ask my clients to do is to practice in the room with me after we're done talking about a difficult subject, we'll do some of that really deep belly breathing. The cue to your nervous system that what we just did is not dangerous. Yep. It's yep. not dangerous. So there's one more thing about emotion that I, um, I want to talk about uh, related to the midbrain. Um, this is apparently not an easy book to read. I, I like, I, I fantasize about like, oh, I'm going to read that. I'm going to read that. Maybe when I've got some more spare time, but just suffice to say, I've had someone talk to me about this book. I haven't read it myself, but Yak Panksep wrote a book called The Archaeology of the Mind. And one of the things he talks about is how there are seven subcortical affective motor circuits. What he means by that is that these are emotions that are so integral to species survival that they require no learning to be present. And they are care, play, rage, panic, seeking, sadness, lust. Mm. Um, seeking is the mother of them all because seeking is about how do I get my needs met? Yeah. Hungry, I will seek food. If I need nurturance, I will seek warmth. Um, that heartbreaking study that they did of like, a wire, a wire holder with a milk bottle in it for the monk, the baby monkeys, and then a a cloth covered, cloth covered milk bottle for the monkeys, and all the monkeys wanted the cloth. Mommy, they didn't want the wire milk one. It was like it's so tragic. There's more to it. So they were trying to see like what really is going on. It isn't just about sensation of softness. It's about like need for nurturance. Because mm -hmm. even when they took the milk out of the cloth, mommy, the monkeys would go drink the milk from the wire one, and then like go snuggle up to the cloth one. It's just really like oh god. And we have. Um, we have the fourth thickest cerebral cortex in the animal kingdom. Uh, mm -hmm. Dolphins, whales, like elephants are, are, and literally they are just larger bodied than we are. So if you want to think about how fascinating it is that we are that, we are that developed and we are that complex. Um, and so it was Sandra Paulson, uh, the woman who wrote when there are no words, um, she's, she's big into infant attachment and using eye, eye movement, desensitization and reprocessing. She references uh, the archeology span of the mind to say that like, these are these play care, rage, panic, seeking sadness, lust. These are the things we need for to survive. But if you can't express these emotions, 
if you can't express these emotions because it's not safe to do so, because if you get mad, you get punished. Mm -hmm. Or even if you look scared when your parent is yelling and they say something like, you are you freaked out? I can give you something to cry about, right? Yeah. Like I'm I'm going in the extreme level. Maybe like you're crying and your mother walks in and her face is just so obviously a wash in just like anxiety and like overwhelm. You learn not to cry. You learn not to be angry. And you know what works a real treat for that is shame. Shame mm-hmm. is like a circuit breaker for all of these seven subcortical affective motor circuits. It allows you to align your worldview with your caregivers, kind of what Tab was talking about before, that idea of like, it's my fault. Mm -hmm. How do you stay safe? Well, you could tell yourself that you are indeed the problem. And the reason that you're having a hard time is because you are not good enough. And that if you were better, you could get your needs met. And I just want to remind everybody, we are talking about pre-verbal, even like pre-cognitive, just like sense experience of this in infancy. Okay. Yep. We're not talking about you as a 10 year old being like, I wonder if I could make better grades. Cause eventually you'll have the skill set and the ability to do that. I wonder if I can just like take better care of my mom, if she'll uh, not get as mad or not go out and get loaded. Um, but when you're one, when you're six months old, you're still wired for safety. So if you're crying and your mom seems too freaked out to handle it, that's scary for you because then she stops being safe. But you notice that when you smile and when you don't cry, she seems more relieved. Well, the safest thing for you to be is an easy baby. You betcha. I would take it even to in utero, Beth. I mean, how I cannot tell you how many times we've worked on, I was an unwanted pregnancy in my clinic. I mean, yeah, I know. we know, we know because oh, yeah. we're wired. Right. The relationship. Right. Right. Um, so very briefly, I just want to check in on this. When we talk about this idea of like, why, 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 um, when clients come in and go, why would I do this? And I go, we are wired to protect ourselves and we always have them. So this idea of mindfulness, skillful, skillful mindfulness. Okay. Check it out. You know, 3 million years ago, if you and I are like walking around together and there's like this cliff edge and I'm like, Hey bud, let's walk to the edge of this cliff. Cause I bet the view is going to be amazing. And you get this like, no, don't sense in your body. And you're like, I don't know. I think that's a bad idea. And I don't have that same, like, Ooh, don't kind of sense in my body. I'm like, I don't know, girl, I'm going to do it. I walk to the edge of the cliff. I tumble down. I don't pass down my genetic code to the next generation of humans, but Tab does because she's got that good sense of like, that's dangerous. I'm not going to do it. Whereas I was like, I don't know. Seems like a fun experience. We were learning all the time about how to differentiate between dangerous and safe. Yes. And we passed that capacity and that skill set down to our children over the course of thousands into millions of years. And so I have almost lost my train of thought. Let's see if I can rein it back in here. And so anxiety was something that kept us Mm. alive Mm -hmm. because if the sky is getting dark and I'm like, Oh shoot. I remember that one time that my buddy got struck by lightning. We all need to find somewhere to shelter. That's me like feeling anxious about the thing that's coming. And then we all find a cave. We don't get struck by lightning. We live to procreate and to fight another day. Right. Or another great example of like, how does this all work? I maybe have used this example with you before, not necessarily like in, in our podcast, but like if you and I are just hanging out and then some like big alpha female walks over and is like, give me your apple. Yes, ma'am. And I'm going to go. Head down, apple up in the like the classic sub submissive position of like, yeah, listen, take my apple. You can have it. I had to make a split second decision about whether or not that was my day to try and usurp 
this alpha mammal, or if that was my day to be like, yeah, listen, I'll find another apple. I didn't even want that apple. Um, so I like, we have that ability to just like trust our gut. My gut says not today. Give yeah. It to yeah. And, and I really- sees that and is like, I'm probably not going to fight that lady either. Right. So we're learning from each other all the time. And then we are in 2022 where we're receiving something like 50 plus of those kind of threat responses a day, a day, a day, getting cut off in traffic, getting a text message from your partner that says something like, I can't believe you would do that. And you're like, do what? (laughs) And just your constant news feed. Right. right. It's not even happening to us, but we're still absorbing the trauma of other people. Right. Mm -hmm. And so then to, we are wired to be activated, to respond to threat. And so when my clients say things like, I don't know why I'm so anxious, everybody else seems to be, you know, like managing fine. And my, my immediate uh, rebuttal is, well, you don't know what the inside of their sink looks like. You don't know what their day to day is like, but fair enough. Why are you anxious? Because your brain is excellent. At yes. yes. And you're exhibiting all of the ev- evolutionary um, positives that we've had through the reptilian brain through the development of the mammalian class of animals and then up into humanoid. Right. right? And so your brain is awesome and it's doing its job. Right. I just want to throw in there that for some of us, we've had habits or behaviors over the years to try and um, counteract our traumatic responses. That seeking that you're talking about is also important when you are thinking about your response to trauma, because guess what else we remembered? We remembered where all the high calorie foods were kept. So we remembered the sugar berry bushes, we remembered the fat filled nut places, and we will return to those things for satisfaction, comfort, and sustainability. So if you're somebody who's like, I can't get enough carbs this really might be a traumatic response to you, not just bad eating behavior, right? Food changes yeah, our we, brain chemistry. We also, if we're going to talk about cultural historical trauma, we're probably going to need to talk about things like fat phobia. And other <laughs> we stuff, are going to. But like some, some other day. Um, and so, you know, further, one of the examples I like to give to my uh, students and formerly my clients when I'm talking about substance use and dependence Think about what it's like, listen, if I want to get somebody to have sex with me, I might need to like make them a nice dinner, uh, take them out a few times, impress them, right? But if I want, and like, so we are, we're evolutionarily wired to work for an evolutionary appropriate, evolutionarily appropriate chemical payoff, Mm -hmm. sex, food, shelter, connection, et cetera. Um, Or... Then all of a sudden someone's like, have you ever tried fill in the blank with like chemical substance, mind or mood altering substance? I can get a way bigger payoff for way less work, right? Because like, you know, it might take me a bunch of time to like see if me and this person get along and then ultimately it doesn't work out. Or if I do a shot of heroin, it's better than sex and it happens like that. Yep. So when we talk about seeking safety, We talk about seeking comfort. This is where some of these seeking behaviors can look like things that we can all identify or maybe like not great for us, Um, but they are, they are such a powerful shortcut to feeling relief. Um, If relief, because that's the other thing is if nobody ever taught you how to self-soothe because they Mm -hmm. didn't know how to do it, like what is Oh, you crying? I'll give you something to cry about. Like, what is it actually teaching a child as it relates to like emotionally regulating? Nothing. It's just like sadness is worthless. It doesn't take you anywhere. Fear can freeze you. And then not speaking at all protects you from danger. Yeah. And the expression of emotions can create more danger sometimes as we were talking about earlier. So I'm with you. Yeah. So just recently I watched a, um, a very short video that you could find to uh, Gabor Mate or Gabor Mate um, has a video on YouTube called authenticity versus attachment. Mm. And he talks about how from an evolutionary standpoint, 
uh, reptiles lay eggs, keep those eggs warm. Once those babies hatch, mom is like, bye. Um, and that baby's like, that oh, I don't need you. I don't need no mom. Um, whereas for humans, I went to this talk, Tabitha, it was so beautiful. I, I wonder, I mean, I think I've got the, the bibliography from it. This woman was talking about how like, it may very well be that the reason our cerebral cortex is so much thicker than any other animals in the, um, in, in the animal kingdom has to do with being bipeds, going from carrying animals on our back to carrying them on our, uh, on our chest, that like skin to skin, heart to heart connection. The other thing she said is like, so if you're, if you become a biped, your pelvis has to be narrower to kind of like support you this way instead of like very, very wide. If you're walking on all fours, she's like, so a narrower pelvis means that you have to have a smaller baby. Mm. A smaller baby needs more care for longer in order to be able to develop enough to be able to take care of itself. So what she was getting at is she, and this it's so tender. It was so tender. She's a psychoanalyst. Her name's uh, Delden Ann McNeely. She's from new Orleans too. She was like, maybe love, maybe love and care and like nurturance and connection is the reason that our brain sort of exploded into uh, the powerhouses that they are today. I loved it. I was touched very deeply. Um, but for our intents and purposes, why this is so important is if your mom or dad didn't have anybody taking good care of them when they were little, because they were expected to be grown up too soon, take care of their siblings, get a job, work on a farm, whatever it was. Um, then they're looking at you like, what do you want? What do you want from me? Don't you know that you're supposed to just like, hurry up and grow up. Um, so what we're missing a lot of times when we grow up in these kind of houses is the developmental skill set of naming our feelings, feeling them so that we can recognize that they've got a beginning, a middle, which is usually the worst part, and then an end. Yeah. So how that ends up showing up for clients in my office is they go, feelings are dangerous. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, fear is telling you that feelings are dangerous. Or sometimes, sometimes my client is pleasant. Please don't mis get me wrong. Right. It's sometimes my clients are what, like what feelings like you were talking about before, not only are they not connected to their body and I've been there, but they can't really identify the feelings to even start unpacking them. Right. Right. It's like all rage all the time right. or just numbness. Yeah. So mm -hmm. in that video about authenticity versus attachment, what he's getting at, um, renowned psychiatrist and addictions and trauma therapist Gabor Mate is talking about is we have the need for both. Mm -hmm. We need attachment because it is integral for species survival. If you're going to be a baby for a really long time as a human being, whereas for other animals, it's like, you're a baby deer, you got born, you're going to pop up on those legs and sort of wobble around. And then you're going to be like, okay, I think I got it. I mean, you're still going to like, mom's going to teach you how to do stuff, but as it relates to like walking on your own legs, handled it. Um, so we need attachment as human beings. Mm -hmm. Without it, we will die. But we also need authenticity. We have this need to know who we are, know what we need. This is up to and including the ability if I'm like, hey, let's go check out that cliff face. And you're like, no, dummy. I know what works for me. And that is not it. And that kept you alive that day. Good on you, right? That's authenticity. Mm. But if you are being forced to choose between authenticity and attachment, you're going to choose attachment every time, every time, every time. And because that's why we feel like die. we sell ourselves out. Yes. Without it, we'll die. And we, as adults end up feeling like, why do I keep selling myself out? Why don't I have any idea what I like, what I want, or what I would actually like to be doing for a living? Why yeah. can't I tell you um, what I would be looking for in a partner? But every time somebody big dangerous and scary goes, I like you. I'm like, cool. I'm, I'm here for it. If that's what you want, if you like it, I love it. Right. Like we're, 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 uh, those clients are coming to our offices in their twenties, thirties, forties going, I can't really tell you. We ask questions like, well, what do you like? And they go, I don't know. They could tell you what their mom likes though. They sure can. And how they bought it for her on her last birthday. No, no matter what you do, you can't please that woman. 
<laughs> right? I'm feeling, I feel, Beth, I'm feeling like um, what we're talking about is really important. And I'd like to tie it back into the polyvagal yeah. theory and the vagus nerve. One of the things about the nerve, the vagus nerve that you all should know out there is that it is, I think it's either the first or the second longest, thickest nerve in your body comparable to the sciatic nerve that goes from your hip joints all the way down through your feet. I mean, it's thick. It's a big nerve. And off of that nerve come a lot of different ganglia. And what that means is like this nerve runs down your spine and then along your rib cage or inside your rib cage, these other groups of nerves come off to feed different parts of your body. And Beth, I know you and I have found advanced integrative therapy to be one of the best treatments for trauma yeah. because it works directly with that whole system of nerves. And so there are particular points in an AIT where you'll hold um, and they're all around those nerve ganglia. So for example, your throat, your heart, your diaphragmic area, the area around your lower gut, and then down on the bottom, your root around your mm -hmm. tailbone, there is so much information that comes into you, whether you know it or not, that it's a really important system. AIT is also related to some glandular responses that happen around those nerve ganglia. So for example, thyroid here and your thymus gland here, right? Your pancreas around your stomach. And so it's a very potent therapy because it works with multiple body systems while you're in the presence of your suffering and taking action on it. What's your take on AIT? I, um, I'm glad you brought that back to polyvagal theory. Cause I was like, yeah, vagus nerve. And then I was like evolution. Cause that's, I love talking about that. It's so much fun for me. Listen, I, um, the body keeps the score is chock full of really juicy neuroscience around the idea that traumatic events that you may not remember are sensorially stored in your body. And so bringing your hand and your attention to your body, not to your head, how to figure something out, how to solve this problem, but somewhere else in your body is to also, in my experience with my AIT clients, having them go, this memory just came to me. Exactly. Um, I don't know why I'm thinking about fourth grade, but here it is. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, or I'll say something like, yeah, you're, because listen, um, I really appreciate the, the reflection of your glands, your, I mean, it's also your endocrine system, like where they kind of cross as like thinking about the energy meridians in your body. Um, so for me, the real gift about, uh, the return to some of the older ways of health and healing, um, Reiki therapy, acupuncture, uh, quote unquote, energy healing, advanced integrative therapy um, is it's been working for people for a really long time. It's just now we have the capacity, thanks to the neuroscience and a deeper understanding of the human body to say why right. instead of going, well, I have to poo poo that because, you know, the, the Western model doesn't make any space for like somatic experiencing. That's boring. So right. um, in, the, in, the case study that, in the case study that I wrote um, in one of my examples, we were, um, we were treating like true, true origins of something, true origins of this person's mistrust in themselves. They put a hand on their thigh and all of a sudden this memory of being punished for something that they didn't understand was wrong because they were like in the second grade. So they say something about a body part in school, they get in trouble, they, and they know, they feel in their body, they know when they go home, they are gonna be punished. Um, I'm sharing this as example because this was published in a peer reviewed journal. It's uh, something that that client consented to let me write about. Um, but that nobody explained to them why what they did was wrong. Infraction, punishment. So the other thing about play, the other thing about like seeking, learning, learning is something that we are we have to experience in order to like know how to relate to the world around us. And so if nobody teaches us good, bad, right, and wrong, we only understand like punishment and 
avoiding punishment, we don't necessarily feel equipped to go like, as you said, set a goal and then meet it from like start to middle to finish, or we don't necessarily know how to um, trust ourselves to make the, the right decisions for ourselves. So what is my take on AIT and watching things come up in the body? We're proving to the nervous system that emotions are not dangerous. Yeah. And then people go, well, yeah, but I don't really understand the point. Like, what's the point of feeling? And I go, so you can decide what you, what you want to do and what you like. And if somebody goes, hey, can you help me move? And you can go, no, because uh-huh. <laughs> I don't want to. Instead of going, I have to say yes, because if I don't say yes, you'll be mad at me. Like you can, the idea of quote, trusting your gut or even just to look at somebody and go, I don't know, can I get back to you? Like if you don't know how to do that because your nervous system is wired to protect you by giving other people what they want, Mm -hmm. codependency is kind of the majority of what I, I work with in my clinical practice. Yeah. Um, and, and addiction and like other process addictions, things like gambling or the internet and so on. Um, but you know, that, that example I gave in one of our episodes where someone was like, what if you took all that energy that you were spending on other people in relationships and you just turned it around onto yourself? And I was like, lady, you don't understand relationships. Um, so getting a good relationship with your own emotional life is what gives you the ability to go. I don't think I like my job or, Oh, this is what I want to go to school for. Yeah. Or, Oh, I'm really overwhelmed and exhausted. Maybe I could ask somebody for help. Right. Um, So using advanced integrative therapy, you are, you are bringing up enough distress but to desensitize and reprocess that distress, which then is showing your hippocampus new, you have that, you have now like new memories, memories of desensitizing and reprocessing difficult experiences. So the next time something difficult comes up, your hippocampus isn't, isn't like threatening, shunts it over to your amygdala you have desensitized the emotional charge on traumatic memories while also strengthening your capacity and your experience of processing and and working through something difficult. So, and your brain doesn't care. So, you know, if you're, if I'm doing, um, if I'm using EMDR and I'm deep and I'm reprocessing a trauma memory with someone and it's, you know, here is another time where my parent is shaming me in front of a bunch of other people and I'm frozen. And I go, okay, what happens next? Cause obviously they've like lived the rest of their life to the point that they're now sitting in my office and they go, I mean, what, what is there? This, this kid is stuck like this. This is going to be what their life is like for the next like 15 years. Mm-hmm. And then I go, okay, where, let me pull up your list of like resource figures. You know, the example I gave a couple episodes of like Albus Dumbledore, I'm like, what happens if we bring Michelle Obama into this memory? And all of a sudden this person who's like stuck in that despair, that's like, no, nothing's going to change. It's always going to be like, this is like, oh no, Michelle Obama is going to look at my dad and be like, you can't talk to this kid that way. Then she's going to look at the mom and be like, I think it's about time you got some therapy so you can figure out how to leave this man. And then she's going to like grab this kid, take me out of there. And then I'm going to go have ice cream with Sasha and Malia. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm having a fantasy right now of my mom and Michelle Obama working. It yes! out. I know, right? So what that's doing in your brain is lighting up your own protection neural pathways, right? Lighting up your own nurturance neural pathways, which you didn't get strengthened if you didn't have a safe growing up. But your brain doesn't care if this Michelle Obama is fantastical and in your imagination. All it is experiencing is, and then something different happened. And then I got to feel discomfort and then feel relief instead of stayed in discomfort. So I just suppressed it. 
Right. And that results in that forever distress I was talking about earlier, that it's, this is going to be forever. And I think where I have seen the biggest improvement in my own life through therapy and specifically advanced integrative therapy is that that process happens you're describing. And then afterwards, two things that are real happen. And it might take a little time, a little practice, but one, your empowerment goes up because when you're not shutting off your body and all that information coming in, you're getting better information. So you're making better decisions and it's not overwhelming you at the same time. Right. And so there's this sense of like, I can know what I like and I can manage my life in a way that feels good to me. The second thing is I have noticed over time, so many of my clients get physical relief. Most of the people I work with have some form of chronic fatigue or autoimmune issue or fibromyalgia, something that is just encasing their entire body in pain and fatigue. Mm -hmm. And what we notice is as their intuition goes up and they learn they can trust it. So they have empowerment, their body armoring goes down. Because they don't have to be on edge all the time right. looking, using that hypervigilance we've talked about for danger. And so it's this reinforcing cycle of empowerment equals relief, which equals more availability to get more empowerment and more relief. And so it's really a very lovely cycle. You know, we yeah, talk we, sometimes... I- we describe we talk it as the upward cycle or the virtuous, yeah. you know, the upward spiral, the virtuous cycle where it's like the things you're doing build on each other until you're like, because that's that's the other point I want to get to uh, briefly is like when, you know, using that, using that Michelle Obama example, um, your hippocampus doesn't care that Michelle Obama is dangerous, is, is, uh, is imaginary. You're so then the next time you leave a session and I go, WWMOD, what would Michelle Obama do? And then you find yourself in that moment with your boss being like, I really do understand your feedback. Thank you so much. But uh, let's talk about how I receive feedback better, right? All of a sudden, the thing that you couldn't do at the beginning of this hour, in my example, um, that all of a sudden you can when your boss is just like, you got anything else to add? And you're like, Mm -hmm. you're you're like, wait, no, I do know how to do this. And then you sort of like channel imaginary Michelle Obama into your life. And you go, yeah. um, When, uh, when you send emails with this kind of subject line, it's really overwhelming. Is there any way that we can save those sorts of things in like a to-do list for our, our meeting at the end of the week? And then your boss could go, no. Or your boss could go, yeah, thank you for that feedback. But either way, it isn't about their reaction as to whether or not it was successful. It's about you having done something that you believed was impossible. And then you have armed your, your neurals, your nervous system and your hippocampus, your brain with another example of how you can do that. And then you're like, I can do that. So yep. Sandra Paulson talks about how like shame is like a circuit breaker. It, it, shuts down your emotional capacity in your emotional life. But imagination potentiates the brain, which means it lights up new neural pathways. And the example I love to give is like, look, people were drawing flying machines for a very long time, but the Wright brothers were like building them. (laughs) They were like, if we crash, but we got to do it. Now we all just get on airplanes and go like, uh, it's so inconvenient that we have to wear masks now. I had to wait so long and the food was trash. (laughs) Like, look guys, people have been fantasizing about flying for like thousands of years. Right. (laughs) You know, I think I really like the way you're talking about how it's um, increasing that plasticity so that our minds can shift to a more positive mindset and in high performance coaching. And uh, there's, there's a really great concept called the competence confidence loop. And fundamentally what it is, is that when you try something like we're talking about right now, and it works, even if you don't get the result you requested, the action worked, you did it, you said it, you went there, whatever that is, it builds your confidence. And then when that confidence comes up, you try something a little harder. And when you succeed at it, it builds your competence. So when you feel competent, 
it will increase your confidence, which will then spur you on to try and be confident in different areas. And so I really encourage you to remember that as you begin your journey, or even if you're midway in your journey, wherever you're at, trying things that are hard when you have the skills to remember you're safe is the path out and you can handle it. Yes, You can handle it. Yeah. So we're, we're just coming up on our time now, um, okay. which I, you know, we, we're shooting for like 45 minutes to an hour. I think we're more on like the hour or like later side than that. Um, what would be, what would be one of like the just salient takeaways that if you were, you were wrapping up with someone in session and you were like, here's what I want you to try this week, or like something I want you to consider. And I'll share one too, this, this commitment we've made that like, we want you to have at least one thing that you could just take away from today and go, yeah, I think I could do that. Um, what would be yours? Well, I think I would focus in on the breathing and, and use the breathing you, that you talked about that diaphragmatic breathing with the caveat that when you inhale, take account of how long you're inhaling and then double your exhale, because that exhale is where the parasympathetic nervous system, the rest and digest piece really kicks in. So if you breathe in for a count of four, breathe out for a count of eight. And even if you have to push the breath out a little bit at the end, do it. It will serve you well. Cool. What would be your takeaway, Beth? Um, let's see. When you were talking about trying things that are hard, um, we don't mean call your mom and be like, we got to talk. We <laughs> yeah, mean no. like, Go to a go to a go to a foreign language conversation group and just listen, or like go um, challenge yourself to like smile at someone this week. You know, like do something where you are challenging yourself uh, with it. But like, so the finding your growth edge, right? Yeah. So don't stay in your comfort zone but don't swing all the way out into your panic zone, but find somewhere in the middle of like your growth zone and then go, what would be a challenge for me, but that would probably make me feel really good. Or what have I been telling myself? Oh, I really need to do that. You Mm -hmm. know, go buy a canvas at Michael's like a little one for $2 and paint on it or like do something that helps you you can experience being novice and then building that confidence or that competence. And you don't have to have any money to do this. You can get on any of the free sort of like zoom social meetup kind of things that people are, are making available right now. Cause if you like something, somebody else does too. Um, but especially that idea of challenging yourself, um, Another thing to consider would be just an inversion. Get as close as you can to touching your toes. Don't hurt yourself. Be smart. Uh, But when it comes to like shifting your perspective, um, any and everything is worth a shot. Yep. Uh, Because the other thing we, we have, we have talked about, we've dipped in and out of briefly is this idea of like, um, your internal narrative and the way that you like talk about yourself. Um, And the, the second time we met, I said like, you know, put your hand on your throat and say the phrase I'm willing to change. Um, Another thing that's pretty easy would be if you're like, well, I don't know what I like. I don't know what I would want to try. Do you remember yourself at five, seven, 10? What did you like? What were you good at? do a Sudoku puzzle, find a math problem. If you liked math, you know, like do something, go read up on a dinosaur. So then you walk, take a walk, like do something because in our minds is where we are isolated, alone, hopeless, despairing. And because we are experiencing the world through our mind, through that mental filter, a lot of times what we really need is to get out of ourselves. But if you know how to get out of yourself is to go like, expend your emotional energy to make somebody else feel good. That's not what I'm talking about. 
or dissociating for three hours at a time and not realizing you've been staring at the wall that long. And that right. happens. Right. I want to, I want to pitch two more in there. One would be, um, I can't help it. <laughs> um, as you, if you're at the beginning of your journey and you're feeling a lot of overwhelm, or if you're at a place where you're starting to address some trauma more directly in therapy, track your sighing. Because that sigh, when you're letting out a big sigh, there's a situation going on inside of you where you need to pay attention to your breath. And the other thing, I see your face, Beth, and I'm enjoying that. The other thing I would add is if you're in the middle of panic or overwhelm or flooding, go get a frozen pack of peas and put it on the back of your neck, right where that vagus nerve starts to come down into your body. Or a sour candy. Perfect. And, or if you, if you can't afford to use your frozen vegetables like that, and lots of us are there, take a wash rag, wet it, put it in your freezer. So it's ready when you need it. That cold hitting your vagus nerve will help you transition back out of the overwhelm. Right. Because, uh, you know, so thinking about like when you're in panic and even just being able to say, this is panic, this is overwhelm, this is panic, this is overwhelm. Uh, it doesn't make it go away, but you're naming a feeling instead of letting that feeling begin to like arrest your ability to just like be in your life. Yes. Right. And reminding yourself that it will end because you haven't learned that yet. We feel stuck in that forever. So this is panic and it will end. I heard once at the training that panic attacks actually only last 12 minutes. But they like, feel like forever. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. Like, no, it doesn't feel like 12 minutes. It's like, this is it. This is my life. I'm at the bottom of the wheel being crushed in the mud. But actually, apparently it's like, it's like riding a bicycle. You ride your bike up the hill. You've got the sort of plateau of it. And then the down part is like, oh my God, okay, this is finally ending. But like setting a timer to be like, well, how long is this actually going to last? Because your brain goes, you got to go to the emergency room. You're about to die. Right. Or like, if you don't take that shot of whiskey right now, Right. This is, you're going to be in this forever. Listen, we could keep talking, you know that, but we've also got all this juicy content that we're going to save for another time. And we don't want to flood you, our audience. (laughs) That's right. That's right. Um, If you like what we're talking about, please like and subscribe to this podcast. Please hit the like button on our YouTube channel. Um, You can shoot us emails about what you want to talk about more. Um, or what you'd like to hear more about, you can reach me at Beth at the CPT podcast.com and you can reach tab at tab at the CPT SD podcast.com. That's right. Um, mm-hmm. Thanks for joining us today. We're so glad that you did. We sure are. See you next time.